effort by, led by the Spanish to derail some of the key aspects of the reform uh, was gaining some speed. And we thought they were going to uh, emerge successful from uh, this lobbying effort that was furiously taking uh, place around the corridors of power in Strasbourg. But in fact, the final vote showed uh, what a success it was. And when we got uh, the press coverage that followed that, with praise being heaped on the parliament for having uh, done something sensible at long last on common fisheries policy, and people like Greenpeace and WWF uh, praising us, I had to go to Killy Beggs to meet uh, Irish fishermen's leaders last week. And I thought I was going to have to take body armor with me because I thought if the uh, Greenpeace and WWF are praising us, the fishermen will be ready to throw us in the harbor. But to my great surprise, Sean O'Donoghue, who met us in Killy Beggs, head of the Killy Beggs Fishermen's Association, he said, first words, congratulations on what you achieved in Strasbourg. So I said to him, my God, I'm going to have to go back and read the text of what we voted for again, because if you guys like it, there must be something wrong. But actually, it seems that uh, people are generally pleased that we have ticked all the boxes. Now, I was on the fisheries committee. Uh, I've been on it for the whole time I've been an MEP. But I was there 10 years ago when we had the last reform of the CFP. And at that time, Parliament had no co-decision powers. The Lisbon Treaty hadn't uh, arrived on the scene. And we were a consultative committee only. And I remember we had the, uh, bizarrely, the Austrian <coughs> commissioner, uh, Franz Fischler, was the commissioner for agriculture and fisheries. It was only after he left that we split up and had a distinctive commissioner for agriculture and a separate commissioner for fisheries. And we worked for about six months in the fisheries committee on the reform package 10 years ago. We produced about 100 amendments, and we felt we'd done great work. And we went down to Strasbourg, and Fischler stood up at the beginning of the debate, and he said, I've read your 100 amendments, and I reject 98 of them. Uh, I'll accept half of Amendment 55 and maybe all of Amendment 92 or something like that. And our work had just been chucked in the bin. Now, under the Lisbon Treaty, with full legisl legislative powers to the Parliament, that cannot happen. And that was demonstrated quite clearly with the vote that took place two weeks ago. We are now a full legislative partner with the Council of Ministers and the European Commission. And we've worked for the past 18 months on this reform package on three major legislative reports. Uh, the Common Organization of the Market in uh, Fisheries and Aquaculture Products, which was my report. The Basic Regulation, which is the big one, which uh, the rapporteur is Ulrika Rodust from Germany, a German a member of the socialist group, and uh, the EMFF, the budget for the next seven years, which some people consider is the most important aspect of it, getting their, their hands on the money. I'll say more about that. I'll say more about all these reports later. The rapporteur there is Alan Kadek, uh, a, a EPP, or a conservative member from France. And that uh, brings with it some problems as well. But what basically we uh, agreed upon were the key issues, regionalization. Now this is like the holy grail for what we've been arguing uh, for years. Devolving day-to-day -day management back to the member states. We've had micromanagement from Brussels for the past 30 years, an army of Brussels bureaucrats who have introduced rules, regulations, on days at sea, on technical measures, on uh, designated ports and decommissioning, a plethora of different rules and tax and quotas and all the rest of it, which no other fishery in the world has to suffer uh, so many different bits of rules and regulation and uh, red tape. 
and it has been a disaster. The core objectives of the common fisheries policy were always to maintain and conserve fish stocks and maintain and conserve jobs in the industry, and we've failed miserably in both aspects. 80% of fish stocks in European waters are overexploited, some of them nearing collapse. We've seen tens of thousands of jobs go in the European fisheries sector. We've seen 60% of our whitefish fleet in Scotland scrapped in the last 10 years, taking thousands of jobs out. Five jobs on land for every job at sea, often in remote peripheral areas where there are few alternatives for employment. So it's been a horrendous failure that has led to successive political parties my own included, even coming up with manifesto commitments to withdraw from the common fisheries policy, which wouldn't be so easy. So we set out with an objective at the start <coughs> of the debate on the basic regulation to achieve meaningful regionalization. And we were told from day one, it's impossible. You can't do it. There's no legal basis for it. Once Brussels takes control of sovereignty from a member state, it cannot give it back. The treaties forbid it. But then Maria Damanaki arrived as commissioner four years ago. And she, her background was as a communist in uh, Greece. And you're never going to hear me as a conservative speaking nice things about uh, any other communist that said Maria Damanaki. But she arrived and said, micromanagement from Brussels has been the bugbear of the whole CFP, and we're going to finish it. And the way to do that is to devolve the day-to-day -day management back to the member states themselves. And she said, I need your help in the parliament because I've got the commission, particularly some of the commissioners, up in arms. You can imagine the French commissioner saying, if you give them back power to run fisheries, the next thing they'll be wanting to give back power to run farming. And for France, that was an absolute red line. But Damanaki stuck their guns, and we took legal advice and discovered that under Article 2 of the Treaty for the European Union, it says the Commission can empower a member state to carry out certain activities on its behalf. And based on that legal advice, we set out a plan that the Commission would draw up the basic framework in consultation with the Parliament and the Council of Ministers for the future of the CFP, and then would ask the Member States to run the day-to-day -day management of it, and the Member States have the flexibility to Westminster can hand it uh, control to Holyrood. Holyrood can devolve part of that control on a day-to-day -day basis to the POs, the producer organizations. So the management cascade can go right down the line. And we won that vote. In committee, it was uh, hugely supported. And as you saw, we got a massive majority for it in uh, Strasbourg two weeks ago. Now we have to go into what's called trialogue, where the three institutions meet together to try to work out uh, compromises or a way forward. And of course, we are going to uh, meet a lot of opposition from the Council of Ministers, some of whom are going to say, this is ridiculous. We just can't allow you to get away with this. But we cannot achieve a final agreement unless all three institutions sign up to it. And I can tell you, for us, this is an absolute red line regionalization, devolving power back to the member states is an absolute necessity and I think we're going to win on that one. So we're making a headway. On the other huge issue which of course has grabbed the attention of the public, discards. I've had Hugh Fernley Whittingstall in my office, you know, telling me we want discards to be banned immediately, you know, that we've got to stop discards now. We've got 60,000 name or 600,000 or something names of a petition from Britain alone. And I was saying, you know, 
if you go and show your petition to Mrs. Damanaki, you potentially will panic her into a knee-jerk reaction where she will introduce a one-size-fits-all proposal for banning discards over the whole of the EU. And that's exactly the worst outcome. That's exactly what we don't want. And I said, you know, the only reason we have a, a discard scenario, which according to the Commission, was leading to over 1.7 million tons of perfectly healthy fish being dumped over the side dead back into the sea every year in European waters, a lot of it in the North Sea. The fishermen hate discards and always did. And Hugh Friendly Whittingstall was almost pointing the finger at the fishermen and saying it's your fault that we, we have this debate. <coughs> If fishermen landed out of quota or undersized fish, they ended up with a criminal record. They had no option but to dump this stuff if they, they caught it. And of course they wanted to end the ban, but it was a management system imposed by Brussels that caused discards. And I said to Friendly Whittingstall, we need to replace that management system with something else to stop discards. And what we've uh, agreed now <coughs> is a phased-in ban, which from the 1st of January next year, and I'll, I'll say more about the timetable in a minute, pelagics, uh, will, which are relatively speaking a clean fishery, there will be a complete ban on discarding pelagics. We hope that through the EMFF, the budget, that we will uh, be able to earmark a lot of funding to help uh, bycatch avoidance. Because leaving the fish in the sea in the first place is the major uh, way of, of dealing with discards. You don't want to be simply swapping, discarding uh, one and a half million tons of fish at sea for s dumping one and a half million tons of fish on land. So everything that's caught from 1st January next year in the pelagic sector will have to be logged landed and counted against quota. Uh, we'll give EMFF assistance for technical measures to avoid bycatch, for fitting CCTV to make sure that uh, compliance is uh, paramount. And I can tell you when I was in uh, Killy Bags last week where they have their pelagic fleet in Ireland based, they were pointing out to me that their quota is fished out within five months. Our pelagic quota is fished out in Scotland within three months. Five months in killy bags. But the Dutch fleet, pelagic fleet, fishing in the same waters, continue fishing for the whole year and have graders on board and all their landings are absolutely identical, beautiful round fish whereas we have to land every fish we catch, small, large, everything. And they were telling me last week that they are certain that the Dutch are dumping 8,000 tons of mackerel for every 2,000 tons that they land. And that's why from 1st January next year, having CCTV on board and making sure that high grading is stopped is absolutely essential. Now, I know some people have said that you know you may be able to achieve the first January uh, 2014 timetable for pelagics, but first January 2016 for whitefish, and first January 2017 for all other uh, marketable species, is going to be extremely difficult to achieve. But we said to Damanaki at a meeting with her on Tuesday this week in Brussels. This hard and fast timetable approved by the Parliament shows clearly to the Council of Ministers the way we want to go, and it gives us leverage when it comes to these trialogue talks, these tripartite talks, to be a little flexible maybe over the timetable, provided we get full agreement from the Council of Ministers and the Commission, and the Commission, Damanaki, is absolutely on side on this to implement the ban. There will be derogations. You know, I was arguing that if somebody 
using limited days at sea is fishing off Rockall and catch 30 tons of boarfish as something that is of little commercial value, are they supposed to use up days at sea to come all the way back to uh, Fraserburgh, Peterhead, to land this because of a discard ban, by which time, you know, the stuff would be into a stinking soup and would only be fit for landfill. And no, there will be special derogations to cover that sort of eventuality. And also, species with a high survivability uh, rate will not have to be landed, or clearly that would increase mortality. And under my own report on the common organization of the markets, producer organizations will have the necessity and the, the uh, ability to deal with the unwanted catch that is landed under this discard ban. So we hope eventually that what emerges from the debate will be a big mature fish like mature cod or haddock will be sold on the market in the normal way with half the money roughly going to the fishermen to compensate them for fuel costs for landing this fish, not giving them enough to encourage them to target you know, that uh, species that's uh, overexploited or under a recovery program or to exploit, for instance, immature small fish, but giving them a bit of incentive to cover their fuel costs. And the other half going into a conservation fund operated by maybe Marine Scotland, the government, or by the POSC, <coughs> which would be used for fisheries conservation. And other unmarketable or immature fish uh, going for fish meal and fish oil in countries where we have the ability to do that. In places like the Azores, it would be subject to storage aid to be used for bait or uh, other purposes. Uh, maybe dog food or cat food. The vote in Strasbourg said that there should be no de minimis uh, exception to the discard ban. We were trying to, in Britain, to get a 15% flexible de minimis allowance so that you could continue to uh, dump up to 15% of uh, fish in particular circumstances. And that would be flexible, so it could go from zero to 5, 10, 15%. But that was voted down, so there is zero de minimis allowance. You have to land uh, all uh, catches in future. And the other major breakthrough was on maximum sustainable yields. And I think uh, a good example of why this is important uh, comes from the, the Barren Sea, where they had a stock of cod in the Barren Sea, which had collapsed to 250,000 tons or less. And they introduced MSY as a management system. And now they have 2 million tons of cod. And that, of course, has uh, increased profitability in the sector, attracted uh, fishermen back into the sector, young fishermen. And we have uh, voted two weeks ago for MSY, and we didn't say whether it was uh, FMSY or biomass MSY. We said simply MSY by uh, two, 2015 where possible and above MSY by 2020 at the latest. And aiming for uh, <coughs> levels of above MSY is directly to uh, enable a major stock recovery. And again, you know, I was nervous that the fishermen in, in Killy Beggs, at least, uh, would be angry about that. But they said, no, we can live with that. You know, that's uh, achievable. The other thing was uh, TFCs, transferable fisheries concessions. I was in Vigo a couple of years ago, and the head of Pesca Nova, one of the biggest fisheries companies in the world, said to me, you've got to vote in favor of transferable fisheries concessions. And I said, well, if we do, you guys will come across and buy all the quota in Scotland, and then you'll land all the fish that you catch with Spanish trawlers in Vigo. And that won't only wreck our, our fleet, 
it will close all our major ports. And he said, well, it's a free market. You're a conservative. Why are you against that? And I said, there's no way I'm going back to Scotland and you know, telling my uh, fishing communities that when they open their curtains, they're only going to see the Spanish Armada fishing off the, the coast. So we got, with a huge majority, we got uh, TFCs deleted from the whole legislative proposal. It's gone. Now we will continue with the old system where at the end of a year member states can swap quota from one member state to another if they wish on a voluntary basis. But there will be no ability for uh, the international uh, swapping or purchasing of quota, which I think would have uh, dangerously undermined the sector and undermine relative stability, which would have been a disaster. So, on my report on the common organization of the market, there is uh, a lot of emphasis on uh, how POs should be recognized, uh, what size they have to be, what rules they would have to follow, <coughs> what criteria they would have to follow, <coughs> how transnational POs uh, could come together. So producer organizations from different uh, member states or different zones where they have a migratory stock of fish could work together with the same rules and where they represent the majority of fishermen in a zone, the minority who refuse to join will nevertheless have to obey the same rules. We're not going to force anyone to join a PO, but the minority uh, who opt out of joining will still have to obey the same rules so that you have a level playing field. And just referring back to what I said at the opening, where uh, the Commission will prepare the framework for the CFP and member states under regionalization will be in charge of the day-to-day -day management. If a member state fails with compliance uh, within the framework, at that point, Brussels could claw back control. And that is the best incentive of all to make sure that the member states and the POs uh, ensure that their member vessels obey all the rules. Otherwise, you will end up with Brussels taking control again. I'm suggesting in, in my report, and this got uh, support, uh, majority support in Strasbourg, that we should have an EU eco-label. We've seen MSC labels becoming widely uh, accepted by the public and, and recognized by the public. But only in some member states you know, in Spain, uh, MSC is a, a cruise line. It's not a, a Marine Stewardship Council label that anybody recognizes. So I'm suggesting the Commission should introduce their own eco-label, which would set criteria at a slightly higher bar than uh, fishermen have to <coughs> apply to achieve a license in the first place under the CFP. And that once they have uh, been monitored by perhaps the MSC, who would be subcontracted by the Commission, they would be able to use an EU eco-label with the EU logo and at the EU flag, which would be readily identifiable by the consumers across the whole of Europe. And they could add that to their product so that the buying public would be confident that they're buying something that has been fished uh, sustainably from uh, a sustainable fishery where the, the fish stocks have been properly conserved. Now the reason I introduced this idea and again support, everybody is always complaining because in Europe we are only 40% self-sufficient in marine products. We import from outside the EU 60% of the marine products that we eat and with the dodgy horse meat burgers now and stuff like that, there is likely to be more demand for fish products in the future. And that's at a period when our fish stocks are still under stress and we're trying to get them to recover using MSY, etc. And people say to me, particularly in the aquaculture sector, it's deeply unfair that you can import from Vietnam and Peru and Chile uh, farmed fish that has been farmed perhaps to levels of hygiene 
and with uh, wage levels that we could never compete with and levels of hygiene that perhaps would be a criminal offence in Europe. So, I'm saying that this EU eco-label should be available on a voluntary basis to any companies outside the EU who wish to send their fish products for sale inside the EU. For them, this would be a huge incentive because it would help them to sell their product, particularly if we put a lot of marketing emphasis on this. But they would have to meet exactly the same guidelines as our companies and fish farms and producers inside the EU. So that would achieve at a stroke the uh, level playing field that people have been demanding for years. Now there's going to be a lot of discussion about that in trialogue, but at least it's uh, something that we're trying to achieve. <coughs> Let me uh, finish with some or uh, one or two of the <coughs> problems that we're encountering. Multi-annual plans. We can't have an effective reform of the common fisheries policy without the ability to introduce <coughs> multi-annual plans which give the fishermen the ability to go along to a bank and say, look, here's a bit of paper from Brussels that shows me what I'm going to be allowed to catch over the next five to ten years, gives stability to the sector and enables the fishermen to borrow money to modernize his vessel or to modernize his engine or buy new gear. And the council, uh, the council of ministers, are saying that under their interpretation of the Lisbon Treaty, the parliament should not have a say in multi-annual plans. Now, I don't want to get into the convoluted legal arguments about this, but basically, <coughs> the lawyers representing the parliament, the commission, and even the lawyers representing the council of ministers agree with our interpretation that we must have a, a say under co-decision under the Lisbon Treaty in the preparation and drawing up of multi-annual plans. And for the past four years, each of the multi-annual plans that we voted through committee have stalled at first reading because the council refused to take them any further. And for four years we've been beating our head off a, a brick wall and we've uh, now taken them to the European Court of Justice. But that could take two years for the case to be heard. And if we're going to have a proper, meaningful reform of the CFP, we have to break this logjam. And of course, there are the usual suspects <coughs> in the council who are the ones that are digging their heels in to try and stop the parliament having a say in this, led once again by France. And I, I must emphasize, I am not here to rant about France. You know, I love France. I have a lot of French friends. But this just happens to be the coincidental case that they are causing problems across the, the board. And blocking multi-annual plans is uh, a key issue for us. The Irish presidency have made a, a determined effort to resolve this issue. They got all the ministers, the fisheries ministers, round the table for lunch in Brussels three weeks ago to discuss this one subject. <laughs> then Simon Coveney, the Irish fisheries minister, went to Paris to confront the French government and said, for heaven's sake, come on, you know, we've got to unblock this. 